This is DW News, live from Berlin. Rescuers in the US search for survivors after a major bridge collapse in Baltimore. At least six people are missing after a cargo ship loses power and collides with the Francis Scott Key Bridge, causing it to fall into a river. We'll bring you a live update from the scene. Also on the program, the US Supreme Court signals that it will not roll back access to a widely used abortion pill. During oral arguments, a majority of the court's justices appeared skeptical that a group of anti-abortion doctors had the right to challenge the approval of the drug by US regulators. And London's High Court, uh, London's High Court puts Julian Assange's extradition to the United States on hold. They rule that judges rule that the WikiLeaks founder cannot be sent to the US unless authorities there guarantee that he will not face the death penalty. I'm Phil Gale, welcome to the programme. A major search and rescue operation is ongoing in the United States after a cargo ship crashed into a bridge in Baltimore, Maryland, causing it to collapse. Officials say divers are searching the water for six people who are still missing. Maryland Governor Wes Moore said the ship reported losing power just before the crash and that it made an emergency call that allowed authorities to limit, bridge, uh, to limit act traffic across the bridge. He added that a preliminary investigation suggested the crash was an accident and that there was no credible evidence of a terrorist attack. Well, just to give you a sense of scale, the Francis Scott Key Bridge was 2.6 kilometres long with four lanes. On average, more than 31,000 vehicles crossed it every day and it's a major part of the road network on the US East Coast. So here's a look at how today's events unfolded. The Francis Scott Key Bridge. After the Singapore flagged container ship smashed into one of its pillars. The collapse of the bridge was caught live by a web broadcast. The ship struck at 1.30 a.m. Within minutes, a major search and rescue operation was underway. The Coast Guard's primary mission right now is search and rescue, looking for any survivors in the water. We're basically searching for, for everyone that was potentially on the bridge. As you can imagine, it's the middle of the night, you know, you know what type of traffic was there, uh, how many workers were there. This video, uploaded by a ship tracking service, shows the vessel's path as it went off course and into the bridge. It issued a distress call minutes before the collision. Authorities said workers then stopped cars from crossing the bridge afterwards, saving lives. Experts say the size of the ship simply overwhelmed the support structure. A heavy ship like that will impart a very large load of many thousands of tons when it hits something solid. And the ship has obviously struck the support of the bridge. Uh, not surprisingly, then the bridge collapses because the support is a very uh, relatively flimsy structure. U.S. President Joe Biden said the disaster was an accident and pledged federal funding to rebuild. It's my intention that federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge, and I expect to, the Congress to support my effort. This is going to take some time. The people of Baltimore can count on us, though, to stick with them at every step of the way until the port is reopened and the bridge is rebuilt. Meanwhile, people in the region are bracing for the aftermath. The port of Baltimore is key to shipping on the U.S. East Coast, and the collapsed bridge will likely create traffic jams for months or even years to come. Straight to Baltimore then, where we can join our correspondent, Janelle uh, Dumoulin. Uh, welcome, Janelle. Um, bring us up to date. Well, Phil, just to remind our viewers again of where we are, we are at the northern part of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. If you look closely behind me, you can just about make out the start of the bridge there, uh, which abruptly stops in midair, the rest of the bridge obviously having fallen into the water. You can also see the cargo vessel that has run aground and is stuck into that bridge. Now bringing it back over here, Phil. The, what has taken center stage, the main focus of today really is on those search and rescue operations. They are still looking for those six missing construction workers who were working to repair potholes on this bridge last night. Um, 
when the accident happened. Earlier, we heard from uh, Goverland, uh, Mar Maryland Governor Wes Moore. He spoke a few minutes earlier saying that this search is still underway, that there are still no new updates, that he had spoken to the families affected uh, and uh, has spent time with them. Now, uh, standing alongside him was also a Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg saying that um, Reiterate, he reiterated, reiterated, excuse me, President Biden's uh, message that uh, federal resources will be marshaled to help Maryland with this crisis. Although both officials warned that there will be a long road ahead, which of course is not surprising given the importance of this artery uh, to commuters here in Maryland to transport and to logistics. And a quick word then about what's being said about the cause of the crash, Danelle. There have been reports, of course, that uh, the ship lost power and that it lost propulsion and that it had sent a distress call to Maryland officials saying that a, a collision was going to be possible. But earlier, we also heard from the National Transport Safety Board's chair, Jennifer Homedy, saying that uh, these are reports that they're still trying to verify. Uh, the fact that this is still very early days and the investigation makes her unwilling to uh, kind of say with absolute certainty what happened. She pointed to earlier investigation. For example, the collapse of the Fern Hollows Bridge uh, two years ago uh, in Pittsburgh, she said that that was an investigation that took two years to conclude. So given that we are looking at a day one, Phil, we can expect that many more yet details will emerge as to what exactly happened here today. Okay, thanks for that, Janelle. Janelle Dumoulin in uh, Baltimore. Well, Deb Besser is Associate Dean at the University of St. Thomas School of Engineering in St. Paul, Minnesota in the United States. She's also a former bridge engineer. Uh, welcome to DW. Um, just talk us through the sorts of safety measures that would have been in place to prevent something like this happening. Well, there would have been um, inspections of both the, the bridge and uh, the barge. So um, not exactly sure what the, you know, when those were inspected and on what uh, intervals those were inspected, but that would be um, part of what would happen on, on any infrastructure bridge such as this. Okay, so regular inspections and nothing out at sea to uh, prevent something or to slow something down in case it hit a, uh, a, um, a structure, a, a, a bridge uh, pillar, because this cannot have been unanticipated. It's the sort of thing you would imagine. Um, they say, well, what happens if this happens? Right, well, I'm not particularly, I'm not uh, very familiar with this particular bridge. Um, but I will say, um, we do know that, um, you know, our, our, our loads, our built infrastructure, they, they are aging. And the loads that our infrastructure is experiencing is changing as well. So um, I, I'm not sure what the inspection is, pattern is or any uh, barriers that might be in place for this particular bridge. Um, we heard our, our reporter Janelle Dumoulin talk about the, the Fern Hollow uh, Bridge uh, at, uh, in Pittsburgh, which uh, uh, suffered a similar uh, fate. Um, what can we learn from, uh, from similar accidents in the past, especially once the investigation has happened? Well, I think one of the things that we can learn is, one, there will be a very long uh, study for this bridge to learn exactly what's happened. But the bigger takeaways that we have include um, paying attention to the maintenance of our, our aging infrastructure and to, to be vigilant about inspections, to be uh making sure that not only are we looking at new builds, but uh, what are we doing to maintain the structures that we have out, out there that are already built right now? Right, talk us through the, the, the sorts of things an investigation will cover and, and which agencies uh, will be involved. Uh, I, I'm not exactly sure with this particular bridge. Uh, there's the National Transportation Research Board, which will certainly be involved. And I'm not exactly sure what the specific steps will be for this bridge, uh, but there, the National Transportation Board uh, has been doing 
um, inspections of and uh, investigations for uh, many years and, and have a, has a very rigorous process. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Deb Besser from the University of St. Thomas. Now, justices uh, on the U.S. Supreme Court have appeared skeptical during oral arguments on rolling back access to a widely used abortion pill. It's the first abortion-related case since the uh, same court overturned the constitutional right to abortions two years ago. The court's eventual decision could have huge ramifications for access uh, to the procedure across the U.S. Little pills, giant stakes. A legal battle over access to mifepristone, a commonly used drug to end pregnancies, has made its way to the Supreme Court. On the one side, a group of anti-abortion organizations, and on the other, the Food and Drug Administration. A little under two years after the Supreme Court here behind me overturned Roe v. Wade, ruling that abortion is no longer a fundamental right in the U.S., the issue is set to take center stage here yet again. Whatever this court ends up deciding will have profound implications on abortion access, the drug approval process, and the already explosive political discourse around reproductive rights. The court has to decide whether the Food and Drug Administration acted unlawfully when it loosened regulations around mifepristone's use, with anti-abortion activists saying safety issues were overlooked. But medication abortion makes up nearly two-thirds of all abortions in the U.S., and nearly six million women have used the drug since its approval in the year 2000, with serious side effects being extremely rare. Reproductive rights campaigners fear that a move to limit access to mifepristone is a step on the way to a Republican-led national abortion ban. It is absolutely a slippery slope. I like to emphasize this time and time again, is that over 70 percent of people in the United States want the right uh, to decide on their reproductive health. And that uh, definitely aligns with the access to abortion. And so I think it comes down to the fact that while there is a majority in this country that support reproductive health and support re reproductive rights, we have an agenda that is being driven by a small minority that is very well funded, that is politically um, very well established, and making moves not only nationally but also at the state level to overturn and undermine the will of the people. A decision from the Supreme Court is expected by the end of June, a few months ahead of the general election, where few dispute that reproductive rights will be on the ballot. All right, let's get more from DW's uh, Ferenc Gal. Welcome, uh, Ferenc. Talk us through initial reactions from the Supreme Court justices. As we've heard before, um, the justices today seemed skeptical. These are, of course, the same justices as we've heard also that passed Roe v. Wade two years ago, and basically what was the reason for their skepticism is that they are unsure whether there is even a basis for this court to be brought, for this case to be brought before the Supreme Court. Put simply, the organization that has filed the lawsuit needs to prove that making access to abortion medication easier could injure someone, and the justices did, not, did just not seem very sure that this is given in this case. But of course, their decision, as we've heard, is still out and will be expected at the end of June. Okay, and there were protests outside the Supreme Court building. What was going on? Yes, a few hundred protesters gathered in front of the Supreme Court building. It was relatively loud and colorful. Um, most people there were there to show their support for the right to abortion, for the right for choice. There was a wide variety also of um, advocacy groups. And we spoke to some of the people who were there. Um, let's have a listen. Abortion access is something that is critical for our nation, for our families, for people to be free. I believe very strongly that the Federal Drug Administration's processes should be protected from activist federal judges. I believe that ab abortion is health care and health care is a right of everybody in this country. I think attacking Mifepristone is abhorrent and I think our voices should be heard. So str some strong pro-choice views, as that was the majority of the protesters, but there were, of course, of course, also groups and voices who were against abortion and very critical of the FDA's previous decision to ease access to this medication. Um, but yeah, there were, there were some heated exchanges between these groups, but all in all peaceful, and it was a minority of uh, protesters who was against abortion today. And is this case likely to have any impact on this year's election? 
It definitely looks like it. We've seen in many polls before that abortion is one of the top issues for U.S. voters. The Biden administration has already taken a clear stance on the issue and says it will continue the fight for reproductive freedom. Republicans on the other side seem less clear on this. Um, their candidate Donald Trump has also not taken a very clear stance on it. Regardless of the outcome of this um, court ruling, which we'll see by the end of June probably, it seems clear that most Americans, as we've heard before in the report, are in favor um, of choice, are pro-choice, think that individuals should have a say in whether they have an abortion or not. So this issue is probably going to stick around until the elections and probably even beyond that. Okay, thank you for that. DW correspondent Ferenc Gall in Washington. Now, a British court uh, says that WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange cannot immediately be extradited to the United States. High court judges say they want further assurances about what will happen to him. If the US fails to provide those assurances over the next three weeks, the court will give Mr Assange permission to appeal his extradition on grounds including breach of freedom of expression and because he might receive the death penalty. My correspondent Charlotte Chelson Pill in London talked us through today's events. Well, I want to put today's decision into a little bit of context. Had uh, the right to an appeal, a final appeal for Julian Assange, been rejected today, that would have been the end of the legal road here for him in the UK and would have paved the way for his extradition to the US, where his supporters say he faces 175 years in prison, something that his wife uh, says would have been tantamount uh, to a death sentence. Now, instead today, what we've had is something of a delay on that decision. As you said uh, there, the judges have said that they are seeking assurances on several points uh, from the US, including on free speech protections, uh, and that Julian Assange won't face the death penalty if extradited and convicted. Uh, the US has three weeks to provide those assurances, and if it fails to do so, then a full appeal can indeed go ahead. Now, this is something of a partial victory for Julian Assange. Clearly, his supporters would have liked to have seen that full appeal uh, granted today. But what the judges did say was that uh, he had uh, legitimate prospects for success on three of the nine grounds for appeal. So while it's more of a wait, uh, there is uh, still clearly uh, some way to go in this legal battle. Charlotte Chelson Pill. Now, Israel's defense minister is in London for a second day of meetings with top US officials amid increasing tensions over Israel's conduct of its war against Hamas in Gaza. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin told Yoav Gallant that the U.S. was concerned about the high number of civilian casualties and the lack of humanitarian aid at reaching people. His comments come after the U.S. declined to block a U.N. resolution demanding an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, fueling tensions with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Here's more from the U.S. Defense Secretary. And the United States will not rest until all the hostages are home. Our goal is to make Israel and the region safer and more secure. And as I have consistently said, protecting Palestinian civilians from harm is both a moral necessity and a strategic imperative. In Gaza today, the number of civilian casualties is far too high, and the amount of humanitarian aid is far too low. It's U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. We'll take a look at some more stories making news around the world. The European Union has agreed to soften environmental regulations on farmers following uh, major protests across the block. In Brussels, uh, farmers dumped manure and lit hay bales uh, on Tuesday to protest against strict environmental protection rules. At least two police were injured as they broke up the protest with tear gas and water cannon. France has begun to evacuate its citizens from Haiti as gang violence rampages across the country. Gangs have taken control of much of the capital, Port-au-Prince, as officials struggle to agree on creating a transitional government to fill the current power vacuum. France's defence ministry says there are around a thousand French citizens still on the island. Vladimir Putin has acknowledged for the first time that radical Islamists carried out Friday's attack on a concert hall near Moscow. More than 130 people were killed. Four men have now been charged with terrorism. The Russian president continues to accuse Ukraine of involvement in the attack. 
And Japan has approved plans to sell next-generation fighter jets to other countries. Planes are being developed alongside Britain and Italy and are expected to be ready by 2035. The decision to allow military exports is Tokyo's latest step away from its pacifist principles adopted at the end of the Second World War. Now to Pakistan, where a suicide bomber has killed five Chinese nationals after driving a car laden with explosives into their vehicle. The group was headed to a nearby hydropower project where they were working. The Pakistani driver was also killed. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack, which comes amid an increase in terror activity in Pakistan. The aftermath of a terror attack in Pakistan's north. A group of Chinese nationals were killed, the remains of their car, at the bottom of a ravine. It's just one of the many attacks Pakistan has faced recently. Last year, around 700 people were killed in more than 300 terror-related incidents, a significant increase on the year before. Most of the attacks targeted regions along Pakistan's border with Afghanistan. Pakistani officials blaming the majority of the violence on militant groups based in Afghanistan. Islamabad accuses the ruling Afghan Taliban of giving these groups a safe haven. An accusation Afghanistan's leadership has repeatedly denied. This month, Pakistani airstrikes in two Afghanistan regions increased tensions further. Pakistan says it was targeting a group which had attacked its security forces. But Kabul claims the strikes killed eight civilians. Airstrikes are not the only way that Pakistan is retaliating. It often shuts the border between the two countries, affecting the livelihood of thousands of Afghans. Last year, Pakistan asked undocumented Afghan refugees to leave the country causing thousands to flee or be deported. Many now believe that instead of policies that punish Afghan civilians, Pakistan should engage with the Taliban leadership in a meaningful dialogue as a way to counter the dangerous threat of terrorism engulfing the region. Senegal's opposition leader, Basiru Diamai Fai, is set to become the country's next leader after winning a surprise outright victory in the country's presidential election. The result was largely driven by young voters hungry for change. The president-elect has promised to tackle corruption and to protect his country's economy from foreign influence. But he faces a series of major challenges as he prepares to take office. His supporters call him Mr. Clean. That's because President-elect Basuro Diomaye Fey is promising a new Senegal. The Senegalese people have chosen to break with the past. I pledge to govern with humility and transparency and to fight corruption at all levels. I pledge to devote myself fully to rebuilding our institutions and strengthening the foundations of our way of life together. Faye is not a well-known political figure and only entered the leadership race as a substitute for his mentor Usman Sonko, a long-standing opposition force in the country who was disqualified from the election. Released from jail himself less than two weeks before the vote, 44-year-old Faye is now set to become Senegal's youngest president, riding on the back of Sanko's young supporters. You will see a different face of the Senegalese people and of Senegal because it's a total revolution. Everything is going to change behaviorally, socially and financially. Everything is going to change. Faye appealed to jobless voters struggling under the weight of high unemployment. He also rallied support under a populist pan-African platform. That included promises of economic independence and a new currency not pegged to the euro. But Senegal will also start producing oil and gas this year, which could mean new international partnerships. 
Senegal tiendra toujours son rang. Senegal will always hold its ground and remain a friendly country and a reliable ally to any partner who engages with us in virtuous, respectful and mutually productive cooperation. The run-up to this election was filled with fears of democratic backsliding. Faye now faces the challenge of inspiring confidence on all levels. Experts say Senegal will need sweeping reforms if it's to move forward. There's a need for grand legislative reform that is going to probably devolve the presidential power uh, in the country. And then to also fight corruption, which I think has been the bane of development in this country. Now it's time to see if Faye, a young and unexpected leader, can really lead Senegal into a new chapter. Just time to remind you of our top story at this hour. At least six people are still missing in the U.S. city of Baltimore, Maryland, after a cargo ship crashed into a major bridge, causing it to collapse. Maryland's governor said the ship, the Dali, reported losing power before the crash. He added that an initial investigation suggested it was an accident and there was no credible evidence of terrorism. The court in the UK has delayed a final decision over the extradition of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange to the US on espionage charges. High court judges say they will give him a new appeal unless US authorities provide further assurances that his rights will be protected and that he will not face the death penalty. Don't forget, you can always get DW News on the go. Just download our app from Google Play or from the Apple App Store. That'll give you access to all the latest news from around the world, as well as push notifications for any breaking news. Coming up in just a moment, we'll take a closer look at some of the big stories in the day, in the day, including the Baltimore Bridge collapse. And I'll have more on that court decision affecting Julian Assange when we speak to his brother, and we'll talk about uh, the court ordeal uh, and how it has been affecting uh, his health physically and mentally. That's in the day with me in just a moment.